Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first Polari of 2015. Are there any Polari virgins in the house this evening? Hey homo sapiens, it's me Rogue Marby Scott and I am no longer a virgin. I am no longer a virgin to Polari. So last night I went to an event. It was the um, first Polari um, book reading session and event to showcase um, brilliant talent here in the UK who are writers um, of books, novels and so forth. One of my dear good friends and um, I'm going to say mentor as well because he's helped me a lot, John Russell Gordon. He um, has written another novel called Soldier and um, he was um, so boyishly schoolboy like nervous. He asked me to come and uh, obviously I'm going to go because he supported me so much throughout the last two years. Why am I not going to support my friend? Mm. Getting there was a bit of a challenge for me and Juggernaut because like we knew where it was. However, I'm not good with directions and I refused to show Juggernaut so I kind of just said it's there and it's there and whatever. We did find it one time actually because I'm, I'm always kind of late. Going into the, um, the function hall room, there was this I don't know if there were a couple, but there were a couple of two gay guys and they just kind of pounced on me and I was just like, no. Just asking me questions like, are you a model? Are you a singer? Are you an actor? Are you a dancer? I was like, no, I'm none of these. You know what? It's not all about me. It's about John. So, I'm getting there. I, I remember seeing John and I wish I got this on camera actually. He just looked so nervous and I've never seen John like that in my life. It was kind of weird to see him really nervous. It, it, it was kind of sweet as well actually because obviously you're going to be nervous about something that you care and love. The first reader, Juggernaut was like, she has a calm and soothing voice that just makes you want to go to sleep. And I was just like, that's not actually a good thing. And he was like, no, no, no. I mean it in a good way, like you could just stand and listen. Um, I actually, just to, just to let you guys know, I actually only stayed for free, um, for free readers, obviously one of them being John, just for the fact that I had been up since three o'clock in the morning because I walk Kiara at mad times in the morning and like this event was going to finish around 10ish and I was I was like really tired. I was surprised that my makeup even stood up well. So here is a, a clip of John reading from his novel Soldier. Into an NAACP Image Award nomination. Together with Ricky Beadle Blair, he's the founder of Team Angelica Books, publishers of the 2014 Polari Prize winner Dewey Osman's Fairy Tales for Lost Children. Please welcome John. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my novel, Soldier, my sixth novel. And it's about a, a couple, a, a mother and son, Poppy and Stanlake, who are refugees from a civil war in West Africa. Uh, Stanlake's a 17 year old boy. He's very effeminate, likes wearing a bit of uh, lipstick and women's lingerie and things like that. And they, they come here and then they're relocated. They're located to a grim housing estate down the Old Kent Road. So it's kind of from one hellhole to another, basically. <laughs> and they find themselves um, the prey of a group of local thugs, a group of local petty drug dealers who make their lives a misery. And what they don't realise is that Stan Lake, the young boy, despite being effeminate and small, used to be a child soldier and has done really terrible, terrible things. And when they threaten his mother, he basically goes out in the full slap and beats the crap out of them. <laughs> as, as is the way with bullies, they become fascinated by this. And the leader of the gang, Everill, becomes erotically fascinating with Stanek and they start developing a weird relationship. But in the, in the bit I'm going to uh, read now is just after Stanek's beaten up the crew and his mother doesn't really know what's happening as she's arrived home worried by what went on. Poppy got back from the housing office to find Stanlake sitting in the kitchen, sipping a mug of tea. He had on a white skinny rib tank top, a length of blue and green floral wax print material was wrapped around his hips, sarong style, and he was wearing green eyeshadow and wet look red, red lipstick. He was calm and seemed uninjured, 
Without a word, he rose and switched on the kettle, taking a second mug from the drying rack and dropping a tea bag into it. The kettle boiled while Poppy was unbuttoning and hanging up her coat in the hall. She took the steaming mug her son offered her with questioning eyes. It is dealt with, he said. How can it be dealt with, she said. He shrugged. Please, Stanley, what happened today? Were they there when you came back? No, but they are not always there. What did you do? I showed them some of what they had not seen. They're gone for now, Poppy said, but they will come back. Yes, but they won't bother you. Why not? They will not dare. You do not know what these boys will dare, Poppy said. You do not know what they're like. Stan Lake looked at her leathery and took a sip of his tea. Poppy noticed he left an imprint of lipstick on the rim of the mug. She shivered. The sound of the television in the flat below came up through the floor, the voice of a newsreader judging by its urgent, stylized tone. Though the words were muffled by the voice, the voice would be telling of famine, terror, economic unrest, disorder on the streets, war. Stan Lake staggering out of the forest with a tiara on his head. Her husband, Pacific, kneeling in the dust in the village square, the tears on his face following the lines of the scars on his cheeks. The blade, the boy who loved knives, had held up close to her face, the sourness of his breath, the depthless eyes. You have to work to be human, she thought. It doesn't just happen. Was this then God's plan? Had he made Stan Lake into what he was so he would have the ruthlessness to do what was needed here at the end of their flight? She had been so afraid of him when he returned out of the forest that day. But he had taken her by the hand and his hand had been warm in hers and he had told her they must run because war was coming. Leave that, he had ordered when, they, when she started to gather up a few things for a journey to who knew where. She ignored him and quickly threw together a bundle of necessities. All the while he was looking back towards the line of dusty trees beyond the compound wall. From nearby there came the sound of gunfire and hoarse shouting. Hurry, he said, or we are dead. She knotted the bundle with awkward, nerveless fingers and they fled the village. There had been no moment of reunion, much less reconciliation, not then. And later, during the long days they spent walking the road, neither of them could find the words. During that time, he became a stranger to her again, a spirit in her son's skin, trudging beside her in the wavering heat. Stan Lake discarded first one piece of his uniform and then another as they toiled along, stripping away in stages the outward signs of the soldier, the rebel, the killer, laying bare the slender-armed youth who had never gone to war. With each piece of clothing he put aside, he looked more and more like who he had been before the rebels came. Yet the sameness was an illusion, a lie. He could not go back, as she could not. No one could, only forward. He volunteered nothing about the more than two years he had been away, and amidst such utter uncertainty she didn't ask, unable to drag up from within herself the sympathy that asking would require. And too, she was afraid of As I said to him, he's, he was, I could see he was quite nervous at the beginning, but as he carried on, his confidence Rose, and it was really nice to see a friend of mine do something rather than me doing something. I would never be able to read in public like that. The amount of people that were there, mm -mm, no, not me. Like, I'd stir, I'd, yeah, I'd m mix my words and everything, but he, he did an amazing job of what he did. And um, Juggernaut now wants me to buy him a copy of the book from what he um, from what John read and hearing how the, the writer reads their own work it can make you want to and I think John did that well because now Juggernaut is going to be a owner of Soldier. John also has quite a few other books out so go out and investigate them and you know buy them and um, show your support for an LGBT writer and yeah, I just hope some of my homo sapiens and marbites out there are readers because hopefully in years to come I'm going to be an established writer myself, so yeah. But well done John, you did fantastically and yeah, I, I know you were worried but you did well. You did well.